It's quarter to 12, Nigeria. We either get it right or we fall off the brink. Welcome to Quarter to 12, our monthly podcast where we speak to accomplished Nigerians about their lived Nigeria experience. I'm your host, Gadria Ahmed. My guest today is Imam Abdurrahman Ahmed, who has the global mission of the Ansaruddin Society. Born in Ilorin Kwara State, Imam Ahmed is fluent in Arabic and has both an Islamic and Western education. He has worked as a journalist, media researcher, and manager. He has delivered papers on Islamic issues at prestigious institutions in the United States, including the Harvard Divinity School, the University of Massachusetts, the Brigham Young University in Utah. He's a respected commentator on public affairs, a teacher, an activist, and a community leader. He's listed among one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. He also sits on the Fatwa Committee of the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, a group charged with giving Islamic rulings on contemporary affairs. He is also a member of the Nigerian Interreligious Council, which focuses on interfaith dialogue. Thank you so much, Imam Ahmed, for joining us today on Quarter to Twelve and Radio Now. Assalamu alaikum and Mubarak. Okay, so um, I'm really happy to. Um, be speaking to you, particularly because we're in the holy month of Ramadan. And I thought it was just important to start our conversation where we are, That's which nice. is to ask you from a scholarly point of view, why is Ramadan important, particularly to Muslims? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the month of Ramadan, by the way, is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. And uh, our creator, Allah wa ta'ala, has decreed that those who believe, those who are Muslims, should fast this month for 29 or for 30 days, as the case may be, so that they will uh, find, you know, the sweetness of faith. It is an expression of their belief in Allah and their conviction that the way to salvation is through Islam, so they are obliged to fast. And why fasting? They are expected to fast so that first and foremost, they will obey the command of Allah. Number two, they will have a feeling of, um, you know, what it is not to have, especially for those of them who are well-to-do. They will feel what it is to be hungry. They will um, have a feeling of uh, what the poor goes through almost on a daily basis so that they learn to be compassionate to those who are less privileged, to those who cannot feed themselves, to those who cannot afford the basic necessities of life. Number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking believers to, to, to fast as a way, you know, of enhancing their own health because there is a host of health benefit to fasting. Uh, science today has told us about the tremendous benefit of intermittent fasting, you know, as a way to cleanse the system, as a way to show up, you know, uh, hum- Im- immunity. So something um, Muslims had known for a long time. For a very long time. And something now that the science is catching up. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. So these, among others, are some of the reasons why Muslims are asked to fast. And yet fasting is not limited to only wealthy Muslims. So, for example, um, you say the reason is to sort of adhere to what um, Allah said. But the second reason, like you said, is to encourage empathy so that you can put yourself in the place of people who normally would not get three square meals. And yet even poor people who are Muslims are required to fast. What is the lesson then for them? Because these are people who are used to hunger anyway um, when they fast. No, you, you see, the, 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 there is a, an inbuilt system in Islam to take care of those who are poor, especially during the month of Ramadan. Um, for instance, it is said that uh, if you help a fasting Muslim 
to break his fast or her fast, as the case may be, you have the same reward. So you find out that in the month of Ramadan, Muslims are especially generous. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the end of Ramadan also, there is what is called Zakat al-Fitr, which is uh, a Zakat that is given out um, by those who fast, especially those of them who can afford for those who cannot even afford it, so that at least there will be some form of leveling. Mm. So on the side of the uh, rich, the world to do, it is a way to, you know, uh, create empathy. And on the side of those who do not have ordinarily, whose everyday life is almost fasting, um, it is a kind of relief for them because this is a time that Muslims are generally very generous. Mm. They generally look, you know, uh, out for, you know, the poor people. You get to every masjid during Ramadan. Masjid every, being a mosque. You know, a because, mosque. Because, you know, our audience a, a is mosque, not so 100% Muslim. A mosque, a mosque. Right. You find that um, there is free food for everyone and majority of whom will be those who are ordinarily poor. poor. So, um, so you've, you've already started touching on sort of the issues around my next question, which is right. essentially to ask you to sort of go into a little bit more detail about what the responsibilities of Muslims are during Ramadan, both to fellow Muslims, but maybe also to their communities. Okay. You see, um, the whole essence of Ramadan um, is self-denial. And uh, it's not it's not limited only to the to the rich, but even the and the, to food and you know, which and is the food. one that is the no, obvious no, no. thing. That it's not it's not restricted to abstention from food, from drink, from you know other things. It is uh, um, a, a a period where you feel for the other person, where you are more responsible, where you are more alert to your responsibilities to yourself to your God, to your fellow human beings. For instance, in the month of Ramadan, everyone is encouraged to be extra good, to um, be extra charitable, you know, even in speech. It is said that whoever fasts and, you know, does not um, avoid reckless talk, lying, insulting, backbiting, fighting, the, you know, <laughs> fighting and and, and behaving ignorantly, stupidly, you know, then Allah has no need for his or her fasting. So let me get you correct. You're not saying that ordinarily Islam encourages these things. You're saying even in normal life, these things are discouraged, but we are asked to do yeah. that much more, put in much more efforts to be better Exa people exactly. during Ramadan. Exactly. At any time, these are vices that are discouraged, um, that will attract, you know, um, you know, uh, punishment because they are sins ordinarily at any time. But it is like uh, outside of Ramadan, maybe they, at, they, they attract like 10 points. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Ramadan, they attract like times 10 of that, uh -huh. 100. So people are more vigilant. It is also a means of training them so that... Um, Whatever you can do successfully for 30 days, for one month, you should be able to, you know, carry it over. So it, it's a form of training, training in discipline, training in selflessness, training in self-denial, training in empathy for the rest of the year. You started talking earlier a little bit about zakat, which is essentially the compulsory wealth redistribution, I called it, but it's yeah. essentially a percentage of someone's wealth that has to go towards helping the poor. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what zakat is and what the principles of zakat are? Ah. Okay. Um, it, when we talk of zakat, basically we're talking of two types, the one that is compulsory and the one that is voluntary. The one that is given out every year um, outside Ramadan or in Ramadan but zakat on wealth, and we're talking about zakat al-fitr, which is the zakat that is given at the end of 30 or 29 days of fasting. This is also a form, you know, of redistributing uh, wealth. 
And when we talk of zakat al-mal, the zakat that you pay on your superfluous wealth, um, it's just 2.5 percent, right. uh, one over 40 of your wealth. Um, so it's, it's, it's every Muslim that has has any form of wealth, whether it's land, gold, assets, everything, or it, it, how does it work? No, no, no. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, it must be, um, you know, something that is... Um, uh, uh, A year old in your possession? Yes, yes. It, 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 there are categories. Number okay. one, there is Zaka of money. Right. And um, it is the, the standard is 85 grams of gold. And that translates to um, whatever, about two million something now. Mm -hmm. um, it could be less based on the strength of the national currency of the country's concern. This is the minimum. Right. And when you have it for one whole year, mm. all right, if you have, for instance, two, two million at the beginning of the year, uh, not minding the fluctuations within the year, if at the end of the year you still have up to two million, you know, or more, then you take, you know, 2.5% of it and redistribute. Who do you redistribute to? Okay. What's the criteria there are of the eight, people who eight receive? Eight categories of people that are beneficiaries of these. Uh, number one are the extremely poor. Extremely poor, those who live, you know, above the 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 poverty line um, maybe it's defined as maybe less than one dollar a day or something like that mm. depending it varies it's not static and um, those who are poor they are not especially poor they are poor they are finding it very difficult to pay their bills to meet up with um, you know their financial obligations they are also entitled to it those who are in debt you know um um, those who um, um, you know in those days uh, it is a means of um, when, when slavery because the, the Islamic system the Islamic philosophy is to face out slavery you could also give those who are enslaved well maybe there are sophisticated forms of slavery now and that's Mm. to my understanding, is also a form of slavery. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who are paying debts. If you, if, if you give them zakah, then you can you know, help them out of uh, the debt trap. And uh, so, it, so these are the categories of people that are beneficiaries of zakah, okay. you know, zakat al-mal. Yeah. Mm? During Ramadan, anyone who cannot afford to give the cattle fit after fasting is an automatic beneficiary and that the fact that he or she is not able to give qualifies him or her to, to receive to receive right it doesn't matter uh, what what car he drives or she drives what house he or she lives in for as long as he or she cannot afford to pay you know um, or give out a zakat al fit, then he or she automatically qualifies and becomes a beneficiary. So this is the system in Islam. Okay, so Islam, you know, is seen as largely a very charitable um, religion. That's right. Partly because of the provisions it keeps making for people that are poor. Um, given though the sort of situation we now see with beggars on the streets, you know, um, especially what Nigerians know as the al Majiri system. There's been a lot of criticism of, you know, um, what people believe is an element of Islam that encourages handouts and therefore makes people sort of lazy. How do we respond to that criticism? You know, I, I think the criticism um, is uh, born out of a fundamental misunderstanding of the religion, the institution of zakah, and the management of the zakah system in contemporary times, especially in northern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, because zakah is actually meant to reduce the, the, the gap between 
the the haves and the have not. It is meant to alleviate, if if not eradicate poverty. Let me tell you, and so many people will be stunned that um, we the the total uh, amount of zakah that is being paid in Nigeria runs into billions of naira every year. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this is not being properly administered. And in terms of its uh, enumeration, in terms of its collection, and in terms of its distribution. And this, pre this is precisely why we have the, the Almagri system and other systems that, uh, you know, appears to encourage people, you know, um, to beg, to, to, beg, to yeah. wait for handouts, mm. you know, and to believe that it is their destiny. It is not their destiny. Mm. Everyone has been empowered. And of course, the institution of zakat emphasizes the fact that it is the rights, hak, it is the rights of the poor over the rich. So it is not arms. Mm. You know, in the traditional sense, no, it's it actually is not. An, okay. No, no, There's no. Some, something they're entitled to. It is their entitlement. Okay, but you you sit, you know, on the board of the um, Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, at least the Fatwa community. That's right. Um, why haven't we seen an attempt to sort of, if it is like structure zakat properly, maybe centralize it? encourage Muslims perhaps to pay it into, if not at least a central uh, purse, maybe a regional purse, where you can then get, you know, respected imams like yourself to actually manage it. Of Why are we not having those kind of conversations? No, of course, we, we, there are a number of attempts. I'm aware um, we have colleagues in Kano mm. who are working on these. Um, and uh, there is also... Um, uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, serious attempts. And of course, it's working in Sokoto. Mm -hmm. um, you have, uh, these days, you have Zakar Foundations. Um, in fact, you have individuals, uh, I don't want to mention names, mm -hmm. that have also created, you know, uh, foundations where they, 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 they handle the distribution of their Zakar. So, but you see, at the level of the states, you know, this has not been, you know, very successful. There are, you know, uh, agencies that are now in charge of zakah. But compared to the volume of zakah being given out, um, this is still scratching the surface. And, of course, we have um, traditionally, you know, people will be averse to change. Mm. There are those who are benefiting, you know, from... This zakah and they are, you know, appropriating it to themselves. They are not; it's not really reaching uh, the people that are supposed to benefit. You know, there is um, some form of resistance. But I can I can assure you that um, it is a work in progress and it is getting better. And now that um, you know, banks and other financial institutions especially those of them who are running the, the non-interest financial system are getting involved, things will certainly get better. You have... Um, so so, so let, let, let's, you know, explore that a little bit because okay. I think you are, you've been involved in um, the Takaful type of That's banking, right. which is sort of non-Islamic right. banking, essentially. That's right. That's um, right. So, so what I'm hearing you say is that in the past, the... Um, institutions in Nigeria did not support um, sort of Islamic distribution of wealth because exactly. there were issues around interest, which is anti-Islamic. Right. But now we are beginning to get institutions exactly. that Muslims can feel comfortable putting their money into and, pay their zakat and then into. they can pay their zakat out of it. Um, but the sort of problems facing the Muslim community appear to be rather urgent and may not lend themselves to sort of the level of time you require for this kind of things to sort of permeate. So for example, in Northern Nigeria, 13 or so million children still roam in the streets, still being called al majure in the name of looking for Islamic education, but in reality, subjected to abuse, hunger, 
um, living under sort of all sorts of weather, etc., etc. And many argue that they then become vulnerable to crime and to radicalization, another problem that is facing us. As a leading member, you know, of the Islamic leaders, you know, in, in, in Nigeria, what are the conversations that are taking place regarding dealing with these particular issues and the impact they are having on the Ummah, the Muslim community? Is in particular, but the wider community in general. Exactly, yeah. exactly. First, let me tell you that um, I know about 10 people in northern Nigeria uh, whose zakah will be enough, you know, in the next five, ten years to fix the educational requirements of these um, children who are roaming the streets, if properly harnessed. And I can assure you that efforts um, are being made to ensure that this is done. Of course, you know, we, we, we are in a very um, a conservative situation. And um, uh, you do not expect that even at the, f at the level of uh, the fatwa committee, we could even engineer consensus. But I can assure you things are changing, even though one would have wished that it is changing faster to cope. With because many are saying we may not have time. Because of you know, the I, I know, I, I, I realize that yes. time is running out. Mm -hmm. And I realize that even some of these things um, uh, you know, uh, 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 50 years late. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do realize. But nevertheless, it is still better than not doing anything. Mm. We could, for instance, it's very sad but true. One of our colleagues, um, I don't want to again mention names, mm. um, was kidnapped. All right? You know, the funny thing is the kidnappers made him to lead prayers each time. Five times a day, he was the imam leading them in prayer, and they were telling him, look, we hate to do this to you, but we don't have a choice. So there's always been an assumption among a few of us, and I think if you sort of listen to public discourse, that some of the criminals that are sort of terrorizing our communities do not even have enough Islamic knowledge and that that perhaps explains one of their, the reasons why they are sort of um, into criminality. So when you say that they are actually praying five times a day and getting someone that they kidnapped to lead them in prayer, it suggests that they are actually Muslims. It's a bit disturbing, isn't it, that members of the Ummah are responsible for terrorizing the Ummah and the wider community. How did we get here? Oh, unfortunately, it is true. They are Muslims. But you see, the do not understand Islam. They practice what they do not understand. For them, salah, prayer, is culture. It's a cultural thing. It's something they are accustomed to. Some of them may not even be able to read Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Quran, properly. But you see, they, they, they have that cultural attachment. And of course, they don't understand it. But how did we get to the point that our own children will become uh, the ones that will kidnap and torture us. And of course, cause uh, untold hardship to others. Of course, it starts from the fact that we have been negligent of our role as parents, as ulama, as, as teachers, as scholars, you know. We have been negligent. We have never been at home, you know, for our children. Um, we have never taught them. Um, real Islam. Y you know, you get children who have memorized the Quran. They don't know the meaning of Fatiha. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is the essence of the Quran that they have memorized? Um, They're just mouthing words they don't understand. They're just mouthing it. And you have a system where people thrive on enslaving others mentally, physically, economically. And they think it is part of the privileges that they have been given by the Almighty. I can say this is very, very far from the truth. It is not so. Mm -hmm. And for so long, the ulama have not spoken out. They have not fulfilled the role that they expected to, you know, fulfill in society. They have not sufficiently warned. They have not, you know, um, uh, lived 
most of the things they are preaching. They, they became very complacent. And of course, this is the price that we're paying. I can tell you of a very sad story. Again, another colleague of ours, you know, um, a sheikh was kidnapped. Where? And of course, you know, somewhere, you know, around the uh, United States, you know, Tegina, all this area. Where you mm. have the big issues there. Yeah. Right. Now, that's where he was kidnapped. And, you know, that was a long time ago, not very recent, about uh, three, four years ago. Y you know, and um, after about a week, the kidnappers, y you know, met him because they discovered he was uh, uh, a sheikh. And, um, you know, the long and short of it was that most of them told him that um, they never knew who their fathers, you know, are. Right. That they, all of them were children of rape and they live in the bush. All right. That their mothers went to town to, to sell milk, fura, the nunu, and so on, and they were raped, you know. And they gave back to them. So they became very angry that their fathers must be somewhere enjoying and they are in the bush and they want to take it out on society. Mm. These, of course, we are responsible by design or by default. Would you agree that um, Islam in Nigeria in particular is facing a crisis when you look at what is being done in the name of Islam, starting with Boko Haram in the Northeast, but also some of these issues that, you know, you've sort of alluded to, you know, people who call themselves Muslims partaking in crime, and the fact that societies that are predominantly Muslim, like in the North, appear to be unraveling and unraveling really fast. Okay, you, you see, it, I want to make a distinction between Islam and Muslims. Right. Now, I think this, this distinction... Is fundamental. Okay. Um, you know, they, they, they are Muslims because they were born by Muslim parents, they were given Muslim names, they were born in Muslim environment, but they never practiced or understood Islam. So I would say the Muslim community in Nigeria is facing, you know, monumental challenges, not Islam. Okay. Not Islam as a religion. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this because there is a, 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 a distinction between um, uh, uh, religious expression and religious experience. Religious expression is, you know, I'm putting turban. My head may be empty. Mm -hmm. right? I may not know anything. Right. Um, people may bear me answer Ahmad and um, they can read Fatiha. So this is the situation that we are, are facing decaying institutions. Um, the, I went, for instance, to, I started, um, my mother taught me to read the Quran. I started, you know, my education from uh, Makarantan Zauri. Okay. You know, um, this is where I learned to read the Quran, and this is where I learned, you know, basic morals. But you look at Northern Nigeria, you, you know, I, 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 I was never enslaved. Okay, so let, let, I'm happy you brought up the issue of your mother. Yeah. Because again, the communities that are technically Islamic or that are supposed to be Muslims in, in Nigeria, the position of women there seems to have regressed. Um, we have situations where women are not allowed to go to school. Um, very little Islamic education and more or less zero Western education. Um, married off some of them really young, 11, 12, 13. And there's been sort of a debate around whether we should um, control and, you know, increase the age at which women marry. But the sum total of the impact of what's been going on with women, particularly in northern Nigeria, is that we've seen a direct correlation between what's happening to them. If you look at the numbers and the sort of decay in society. What is the Islamic position when it comes to women, education, early marriage, et cetera, et cetera? Most of um, the scholars in Islam 
like um, Imam Shafi, um, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, Imam Malik, most of them were taught by their mothers. And this is the eternal testimony uh, that Islam values education and uh, raises education to the highest pedestal possible, especially the education of women. Aisha, the, the young wife of the Prophet ﷺ, was the teacher of many Sahaba. When there are naughty issues, naughty questions, they refer to Aisha. The Sahaba being the companions, the companions of, of the, the Prophet, Prophet Sallam, 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 Sallam. You know, yeah. among um, whom uh, was the father of Aisha. You so know. they're supposed to be learned themselves. Women, women but they come to her when they are yes, not sure of things. When they are not sure uh, and uh, they respect her opinion because of the superiority of her knowledge. Especially the fact that she took knowledge directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, so she is closer, clo closest to the Prophet Sallallahu closer to the Prophet than all of them. She knew the Prophet, you know, in and out, um, and they defer to her opinion. And her, and, and her opinion, you know, was always informed opinion, verifiable opinion, not just dogmatic. And of course, this tells you, look back you know, to the, 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 like 50 years to now and see the women of Northern Nigeria, how, how, how educated, how disciplined, how resourceful they were. You know, the question to ask is how did we get to this kind of a past where women were, you know, one of even the, 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 mo the toughest question between Sheikh Usman bin Fudi and uh, Sheikh Al Amin, you know, Al Kanami mm -hmm. was um, uh, that Al Kanami accused Amfodio of allowing women to mix. And he said, Well, um, I will allow them to mix because that is better than keeping them at home and, you know, making them ignorant. And I mean, Nana, Nana Asma was famous for running schools. Exactly. Where she so, sort of went so, into so, communities so, so this, and established. This, this, this is uh, our heritage. This right. is our past. So who, who can now uh, tell us that it is because of Islam that uh, women... But uh, is it the, that, that is the excuse, though, that we hear. It can so, never be an excuse. Mm. It is rather... Uh, 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 the situation will correctly be it is because of the abandonment of Islam itself that and, and the value it places on education, particularly that of women, that we have found ourselves okay, where so, we so, are So that's today. Islamic education. What about Western education? Because, let for example, you, if you look at... Let, let me ask the question, okay, Sheikh. Okay. For example, if you look at Boko Haram, their very name, um, suggests that they are against Western education. So when it comes to women, again, what is the Islamic position when it comes to educating women in the Western way? We've established that Islamic education is allowed, okay. is encouraged, no, 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 etc. No, 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 let me tell you, what, what is Islamic education, by the way? I think there is a, f a, a fundamental confusion mm -hmm. because in the view of Islam, education is comprehensive. Covers everything. Yes. Their education is not Western, is not Eastern, is not Oriental, is not Occidental. There is a hadith of the Prophet, he said, Al Hikmatu Dholatul Mu'min. Wisdom is the lost property of a believer. Haithu wajada'a akhadaha. Wherever he or she finds it, let him or her take it. So where did we get this concept of Western and Islamic education? Mm. First, two, let's look at our predecessors. Let's look at Sheikh Uthman bin Fudi. Let's look at the subjects, you know, um, that uh, um, he has written, you know, on. It, it, it knows just about Tawheed and Fiqh and Tafsir. Even he has, he has written about uh, governance, all right? And people will tell me that governance is uh, Western. Mm -hmm. who, who says that? Yeah. Now, the, the, the one who invented a logarithm that we use now 
um, to make life very easy and sometimes very tough and difficult for us is al khawarism who is a Muslim. So where did we get this distinction between Western and Eastern? And of course, if you read my biography, um, even though I started primary school at the age of 14, oh, people, wow. still, <laughs> people still accused my father, you know, of compromising. They said, why should an Islamic scholar st send his child to, you know, a, a Boko school? All right. My father's understanding was that, look, Arabic you know, is useful for you to be able to understand the deen. But then you need to learn others, you know, learn English, learn French, learn anything, learn. learn. That's, that's how I got to be educated. And this is the story of so many others like me. Mm. Again, it is corruption of understanding that so, has led us to this. Okay, so in, in recent times we've seen um, even countries like Saudi Arabia raise the age of marriage to sort of 18. Um, and part of what we read is that they've done it because they realize early marriage tends to come with certain issues. When children give birth to children, um, all sorts of complications can arise. And that, you know, it's important for a woman to have a certain degree of minimum of education, even if it is so that she can educate her kids, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. In this country, we've seen resistance, particularly from National Assembly members from the North, who, when an attempt has been made to sort of establish this sort of um, standards for women, they've said it is anti-Islamic. Is it anti-Islamic to sit down and do a fatwa and decide that, you know what, given our circumstances, maybe we shouldn't marry off girls at 11, at 12. Maybe we should wait until... They are 16, they are 17, they are 18. You know, absolutely. I don't have any problem of limiting, you know, um, the, the, the age of marriage for young girls. Right. I don't and have it's not anti-Islamic to have no, that it position. Is no, it is right. not. You will never find any texts, either in the Quran or the Ahadith, where the age of marriage specifically is mentioned. Mm. It is up to... Um, you know, uh, ulama, you know, people, stakeholders at every point in time in different countries to sit down and determine what is in the best interest of the country and the individuals involved. So it would not be wrong for there to be a fatwa to regulate the age of marriage. It is absolutely in compliance of Islam. Mm. I think I'm not holding brief for members of the National Assembly or anybody. I think uh, what people are opposed to is wholesale, you know, uh, imposition of Western norms and values, you know. Um, a but well, we've just determined that things like education are not Western. And, and, and no, no, I'm not and talking if you about Western at, education. Okay, no, I'm but not I'm talking about the if, age of marriage. Yes, but I'm saying if we look at the position of Saudi Arabia when it comes to the faith, being the holy land, where our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, where he received his wife, where he, he you know, basically introduced Islam, you know, to his immediate community, his family, and then it spread out. They have sort of taken a step back and looked at their communities and have decided, we think girls should be married at the age of 18. Nobody is accusing them of westernizing their communities no, as no. a result of doing something like that. No. So it seems to us that sometimes, particularly as Muslim women who sort of see the impact of this sometimes. For those of us who do community work with young girls, we see young girls who are very hurt physically, suffering from VVF in hospitals because, you know, they've been married off when they're not ready. We see girls at 11, 12, 13 married off as second, third wives. And then by the time they're 16, they've had two, three children. They kicked out of their husband's house for him to marry an even younger girl. And many of them go away with children that they can't look after. We look at all of that, and we're very disappointed that our religious leaders do not appear to understand the importance of legislation that protects these girls 
because the basis of our society has been eroded. And I think the evidence is beginning to show. So, so and, and, and the excuse we keep being told about why this is not happening is, oh, people don't want an imposition of Western culture. This has nothing to do with Western culture. It has everything to do with rights and doing right by our communities and our daughters, surely. Yeah, I think you should properly understand my position on this. Okay. First, let me state, I don't have any problem from the Sharia point of view, based okay. on my understanding of, um, you know, uh, giving uh, girls education to the highest level that they are able to go. I don't have any problem from the Sharia point, uh, Sharia point of view regulating the age of marriage. I don't have any problem from the Sharia, of, uh, Sharia point of view even reviewing some of the existing legislation on marriage and divorce, you know, some of which I can assure you are not Islamic at all. Mm. They are not uh, Islamic at all. It is not Islamic. It's cruel for you to just wake up and throw out a woman that you have married, a woman that you have made so useless and dependent that she cannot fend for herself, that she has no education, that there, there, there is nowhere to turn to, and uh, she cannot enforce her right. That cannot be Islamic. I don't have a problem. With so that. what is our solution then? Now, our solution is this. Number one, you see, um, how did we uh, get to the point that parents will even allow their children to get to be married off at nine? Mm. Maybe it is because they are not sufficiently educated. They are not sufficiently exposed and you some know? of them financial issues as well. The exactly. Poverty. Poverty. Um, you know, um, these are some of the issues. And I can, I can assure you that, um, for instance, the, 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 the Sultan Foundation is doing a lot, you know, in terms of preventing violence against women. Um, they have had, um, you know, seminars, they've written papers, they have uh, even been trying to influence legislations, you know, around the, pro the protection of the rights of women. But, of course, it takes one whose right is violated, you know, to assert that she has rights in the first place and to seek redress. Right. Let's, let's um, leave that for a little while and go into something that is slightly related. Again, issues around people who've been put in charge of communities, leaders. Often, you know, you hear people say Islam encourages us to pray for our leaders. Islam encourages us to follow our leaders because, you know, leadership is given by God and we shouldn't be challenging them. What is the role of Muslims in a society where leaders are patently doing things that are wrong? Yeah, you know, the, the Islam is based on what is called amru bil ma'aruf wa nahi anil munkar, enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil. The methodology may differ, but it is the responsib responsibility of especially leaders and scholars to call erring um, uh, uh, leaders to order. Mm -hmm. The method that Islam recommends is, and of course, our history is replete with um, outstanding scholars who have had to stand up to um, tyranny, you know, tyranny, um, oppressive leaders, and so on and so forth. Some of them were, you know, in prison. Some of them were tortured, but they were still, you know. Um, and in our text, we read that um, um, the worst scholars are those who are found, you know. Uh, at the door of rulers. And the best rulers are those that are found at the door of scholars. A system of checks and balances. What Islam tries to prevent is, um, you know, anarchy. You know, um, that's why some people who do not properly understand it, they say, no, no, we must not uh, criticize. Complain. We, must no, not we com can, we can, we can. We can criticize leaders. But, you know, before we take criticism to the open, first, is leaders in Islam are supposed to be accessible. 
they are supposed to be amenable to you know uh, uh, constructive advice and constructive criticism and scholars are supposed to meet leaders one on one with you know evidence that they are doing wrong and you know the way out this is what you should do instead and they should be ready to be at the service you know of such leaders when their services are required particularly for guidance i do not mean joint uh, taking uh, ministerial positions or appointments no th th this will not be it um yes we should pray for our leaders um especially uh for guidance uh for courage um for good health but at the same time we must be ready to tell them that they are not doing well that no, is no, why no, i smiled a little when you talked about um, islamic leaders and um, taking ministerial appointments as if you were sobbing a particular minister that we know <laughs> no, no 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 not necessarily o okay. of course of but what course, happens whichever whichever yeah. scholar takes ministerial appointment will be taking it in his own name <laughs> not on behalf of islam uh -huh. and okay, not so, in the name of islam so let me ask you what happens where you talk and talk and leaders are clearly not listening what is the responsibility of the ulama but also regular everyday muslims particularly in societies that are facing serious crises, like the sort that we're seeing in the country today? Again, I've, I, I, I've just said that I, I, Islam tries as much as possible to prevent anarchy, the breakdown of law and order as much as is practicable. Um, and of course, this is why for me, I, I, I think... Um, it is a religious responsibility for Muslims to um, make themselves eligible to vote. Um, because but not run for office? or No, both. Muslims can run for office. Right. Muslims can run, you know, if you can vote, then you can be voted for. I do not see anything wrong. I will not stand for elective office. All right, that, and that's, that's me. Your personal and that's thing. personal. Mm. But nothing stops a Muslim from running for elective office, right. all right? I'm just talking about myself. So, um, so therefore, the, 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 the most peaceful way, the most um, uh, constitutional way of removing, you know, a, a, a leader, a government that is not nope. perform, performing is to vote them out, okay. all right? You only need, um, max, in Nigeria, maximum four years. Right. Um, you can you can you can um, you know comment of your of your votes. Your vote so, so we're running out of time. So I'm going to sort of try and quickly wrap this up by asking you if you look at the problems we're facing. We've been fighting Boko Haram in the northeast for close to over a decade now. Sure. Um, increasingly, it looks like their activities are spreading into the um, north. West, you know, um, there is some evidence and, and, that there's a presence. The, and the North Central. And the North Central. Um, are you hopeful at all about this country, the Ummah, and um, Islam in I, Nigeria? I, I pray. I pray that um, um, we'll be able to do the right things. And I pray that we'll, we'll be able to keep hope alive. But I'm afraid we are not doing the right things. We're not fighting this battle the right way. All right? Um, no what one, would be the right way? You, you know, it's, it's an, you know, uh, you know, all out, all out. It's not just military. Military mm. is just an option. We're emphasizing the military approach, the law and order approach. That is not the only approach. Um... We, we need, we need um, investments in de-radicalization. There's already some of that taking place. Though. Yeah, you know, not, not enough. Mm. We need massive social investments, you know. We need uh, massive investment in educating um, these young people because 
they are becoming increasingly, increasingly vulnerable and susceptible to, um, you know, brainwashing. Because, of course, what are they gaining? Their life is meaningless. So, so they're already without hope, and so then somebody let, so, comes. So let us give them hope, you know. Let's leave the, the terrorist leaders, you know, to themselves. Let us give hope to the younger ones that they want to recruit. Let us reform the Sangaya system. You know, uh, that is the basic um, uh, Arabic, the Quranic, Quranic um, education, system. education. Let us be bold to legislate against, um, you know, uh, some of these um, al majri schools. Let's give these young stars hope, proper education. Any money that we spend, you know, on that kind of a project is an investment in peace and security. And finally, um, again, we are in the month of Ramadan, so I'd like you to end this perhaps with a message for the Muslim Ummah in Nigeria regarding what the rest of the month should be like for everybody and if there are any other final words you want to say. Well, this, this month presents tremendous opportunity for change at the individual, community, national and global levels. Uh, for the individual, it's an opportunity to make resolutions resolutions um, that going forward um, will affect the individual and his family. We as individuals must make a resolution to stand for what is right, to do that which is right, to en enjoy that which is right upon others, to create an atmosphere, an environment that is conducive for doing what is right, what is just, what is fair, what is sane, what is ecological. If we carry this message forward to the community um, as leaders, as members of the community, if we do this um, and we watch out, we, we look out for our brothers, um, uh, then it's going to be better. If our leaders could be a little bit more um, caring, a little bit more responsive, a little bit more responsible, more, more responsible, if um, they could uh, link themselves with the hopes and aspirations and the sufferings of the people as a resolution for this Ramadan, then their lives will be better. Eh? They will be happier. They will feel more secure, and they will also. So it's in their own interest to actually do the right thing. It is in their best thing. interest. It is in their best interest because they must realize they can only, you know, uh, run, but they cannot hide. They will eventually live among the same people that, um, you know, they are pulperizing, and it is going to be very tough. But in order to forestall this, they have an opportunity to repent. Repentance repent. is my message <laughs> repentance. for all of us. Thank you very much, Imam Ahmed, for joining us on Quarter to Twelve. And that's it for this month's edition of the program. I was speaking to Imam Abdurrahman Ahmed, who has the global mission of the Ansaruddin Society. Join us next month for another brand new edition of Quarter to Twelve. <laughs>